Hi everyone, thank you for joining AWMP grad seminar. Today we have two speakers with us. Our first speaker name is Samarai Venkata Chalam. She is a PhD student from Imperial College London. And her topic today is minimal model program and the classification of PANOS. Our second speaker is Samantha Brozak. She is a PhD student from Arizona State University. Her topic today is integrating wastewater surveillance with dynamic modeling to track and predict viral outbreaks. So we'll start with Kamarai today. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. Yeah, yeah. so as you mentioned, the talk is on minimal model program and classification of FANOS. So I've tried to keep this like accessible for everyone. Feel free to ask questions if like you're not following something. Mostly it's going to be just ideas. So yeah, feel free to ask questions at any point. Yeah. Firstly, yeah, I'll start with the most yeah, like uh, you guys can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'll start with like, uh, what is uh, everything I'm going to define? So firstly, I'm just going to tell what a projective N space is. So PN, so what is this? There are like so many different ways of seeing it. So I'm just going to say a few, whichever is the best for you, you can take that. So different formulations. One is like, you can see it as space of all lines through origin in CN plus one. So here C is the complex numbers. So complex number, like n plus one copies of it. In that, you can look at all the lines through origin and you can take that space and you can call that as Pn. Or you could also see it as the quotient of a group action. So the group C star acts on the space Cn plus one minus the origin in the following way. Take any element lambda, it acts on an element x0 to xn by sending it to lambda x0 to lambda xn. So by this group action, we can talk about quotients of sets, right? So you can do that, and then you can give a topology, and that way also you can see Pn. Or you could also see it as a compactification of Cn. So we have the complex n space, and Pn is a is one of the compactifications of it. CN is not compact, right? It's kind of vast or something. So we try to compactify it and PN is something we get in that sense. So whichever is best for you, you can think of it in that sense. Maybe I thought I'll do it in a simple case, which is like, instead of C, just to think of the picture, what is happening, I'll do it in R2. Instead of C2, what is, uh, P1R, we can try and see what happens here. So if you notice here, these are the green ones are all the lines in R2, right? So there we can talk about like, now we have to parameterize, we have to take the space of all lines. So if I take something like this space, for example, it cuts every line at one point for sure, right? So I don't need to do here because this line is already cutting there. So every line cuts this red color thing exactly once, except at the end points. So these both points are cutting the same line, right? It's the same line. So we have to kind of join it. So what we get is something of this form. And this will be P1R, but whatever we are using here is PNC, but this is to give an idea. So this is what we are trying to do. If you notice this, this is the compactification of R, right? R is just this line and like you're compactifying it. And like that's what, by adding a point at infinity or something. So, so this is, uh, yeah, this is in R and similarly we can, it's it's tough to imagine, that's why I drew for R. P1 of C is going to be a sphere. It's like, yeah, you have to look at C2, right? Which is a four dimensional space. In there, it's going to be two dimensional. So 
I'm just going to tell it as a fact. You can take it like that. It's it's going to be a sphere when you see it as a real dimensional thing. So, yeah, this is the projective in space. And here we give a particular kind of topology, which we call it as uh, the risky topology. Sorry. So how is that given? The risky topology on PN, the closed sets are given by common zeros of homogeneous polynomials in PN. So you take some polynomials and the zeros of that polynomial are like giving the closed sets. Once we know the closed sets, complements are open sets, right? So the topology is given by closed set. So how does this look to roughly see what is happening here? So if I have something here, for example, if I have some, this is my y minus x square or something, v equals zero, or this is the parabola, right? So this is like the zero set of this. So this is a closed set. Everything outside that is open in that case, right? The complement is going to be open. So all this is like part of the open sets. So the, if you notice here, the open sets are really huge in this topology, like really huge. In the usual topology, our open sets are something like this, no? At every point, it's like this or like, yeah. But here, it's like really huge. It's almost everywhere. So these kind of sets are called dense sets. So here, the open sets are dense. It's a nice observation to see. So they have a lot more information than in uh, usual. So yeah, so this is the projective end space. And why did we see this? Because this is the space we would like to work in because it's nice, because it's compact in some sense. Usually we want to see CN, right? As the ambient space, we always look at CN and look at things inside them. But this is better than CN because it's compact as well. So that's why I introduced this. So in this, Using this topology, we have some closed sets, right? Seen as uh, zero common zeros. In that, uh, we can also further put this condition that it is irreducible. And then we call it a projective variety. So irreducible closed sets in PN with the induced topology. From PN, whatever topology we define, from there we can induce the topology on this subset. With that, whatever we get is called a projective variety. So <clears throat> irreducible in the usual sense, however, we think it's like, again, so if you think of this kind of a picture, this is reducible, right? You can see it as this union, this. So this is not irreducible. Something like this is irreducible. So this is not. Uh, not a, these are projective varieties, uh, and then we have quasi-projective varieties, which are open subsets of a projective variety. Uh, this is just to make sure some additional thing. A variety meaning, uh, when I use the term variety, it, mean, it could mean either a projective variety or a quasi-projective variety. It could be one of these two. So, yeah. So this was to introduce what a variety is. So variety is nothing but zeros of polynomials. It's also irreducible or something. And if you want to think of it in the differential geometry perspective or something, it's uh, you can also think of it as complex manifolds. As long as the varieties are smooth and nice and everything, they're nothing but complex manifolds, but with a different topology, that's it. In complex manifolds, we use the usual topology. Here, we use a different topology. So, yeah. So this is the uh, definition of a variety. You can always think of a manifold if that works better, if this was not right clear. Then, yeah. There is this notion of birational equivalence when we have two varieties. We say that uh, two varieties are birationally equivalent if they have open sets, which are isomorphic. As varieties. So uh, 
so this is a very good notion of equivalence because open sets as i told are like uh, dense in the topology right they are almost like everywhere so they contain a lot of information about the variety so in, usually we, we talk about isomorphism that there is that notion of isomorphism here as well but like this is also a good notion of equivalence two varieties are like biashally equivalent if they have open sets which are isomorphic as varieties so with respect to this equivalence an example of that is like if you take look at this x it's it's just a pictorial way of uh, representing like i'm thinking of x as this some space with a point which i denote by some red point this space is like by rationally equivalent to the space y where instead of that point i'm replacing that point by a line it's like this process is usually called a blow up or something but yeah literally what we're doing is instead of that point we are introducing a line so so outside this point it's an open set here for x outside this point it's an open set and here also outside this line is an open set and x and y are isomorphic on those open sets so they both are by rationally equivalent so if you notice they're not very different right they look almost same except at that small locus or something so it's a very good notion usually and yeah okay what are by rational equivalence class whenever we have equivalence uh, we call them equivalence classes right equivalence class of x is like set of all y such that y is by rational equivalent to x so this is how the by rational equivalence class is defined and our aim is to find a minimal representative in the by rational equivalence class of x so yeah to give some motivation like usually we might have seen this in uh, say like mod or something mod is an equivalence right say i'm doing mod 3 or something this gives us an equivalence relation right one is equivalent to 4 under this equivalence relation because they are the same mod 3 and it's also the same as 7 it's same as 10 and so on so we have this kind of a so in this equivalence class we could use any representative right we can also write it as 4 we can also write it as the equivalence class by 1 but like usually we try to find a minimal one in this case it's 1 right we usually look for something greater than equal to 0 and strictly less than 3 or something so there is the thing of finding a minimal representative something similar is what we are trying to do here we want to find a minimal representative for representing this class and that is the that is why yeah the way you do it is minimal model program it's it's just a program which was developed to find this minimal representative so yeah mainly this program works uh, based on this uh, this object which i will define now it's the canonical bundle of x what is a canonical bundle so firstly i'll tell what a vector bundle of rank n on x is so it is nothing but a vector space attached to every point on x with some compatibility conditions so we can just think of it as like at each point there is a vector space the same thing uh, yeah as an example is like tangent bundle of x cotangent bundle of x so at each point you can attach its tangent space at that point the same thing yeah in the rank 1 case it's called a line bundle because it's like a line right the vector space is like a line so yeah to give a picture again so if i'm having some this is my x at each point i can associate a i can associate a line like this this is a line bundle on so this whole 
the red thing is going to be a line bundle on X. I can't draw it like, yeah. So these are line bundles. And yeah. The canonical bundle of X is nothing but the, yeah, the top wedge product of cotangent bundle. So if you notice here, the cotangent bundle is nothing but the dual of the tangent bundle. And this one is going to be if X is of dimension N, tangent space is also of dimension N, right? So the vector space, it's going to be a rank N vector bundle, tangent bundle and cotangent bundle. So from a rank N bundle, we want to come to a rank one thing. So it's just a way of getting a line bundle from a vector bundle. And that process is the wedge product. Uh, yeah, top wedge product does this thing. So this is an operation in vector spaces, which takes an n-dimensional vector space and gives a one-dimensional vector space. So that way, like doing that on vector bundles, we get like line bundle. So that's the rough idea. This is the canonical bundle. Yeah. And if you notice here, like if x is a curve, kx is just going to be the cotangent bundle itself because it's already a rank one bundle because dimension of x is one. So it will already be a rank one bundle. So yeah. Yeah, the main thing to notice canonical bundle is a very important line bundle on a variety. It encodes a lot of information about X and it is used in MMP, the minimal model program extensively to define the process. It's a very like, yeah, it tells a lot about our variety X. So this is a very important thing, but yeah. So what is the minimal model program? So I'm just going to mostly black box it. So it takes an input, a variety X and it's this magic box. I'm not going to tell what exactly it does. But finally, it gives you an output where y is either a minimal model. I haven't defined what this is, but yeah, it is minimal in some sense. It's minimal model. Or y is a Mori fiber space. So yeah, this is the part I will care a bit more about. So maybe I'll tell what that is. So as the name suggests, it's some kind of a fiber space. So you have some base space Z and then you have fibers over them over it at each point. Something like this maybe. And yeah, this is a Y. So this is a map. So at each point you have a fiber. And the dimension of the base space is strictly less than the dimension here. So this is a Mori fiber space. And these are like, yeah, what I will be using later. But yeah, the program is very, yeah, I, I haven't given the details, but yeah, it takes up a variety and gives the minimal model or a Mori fiber space. So either way, it helps us understanding things better because the minimal models are nice in some sense or the Mori fiber space is like, in, instead of understanding Y, I can understand Z and the fiber F. Here I'll call the fiber F, fiber over a point as F. So understanding Z and F gives us an understanding of Y. And this is definitely simpler than Y, right? Because dimension of Z is already smaller than dimension of Y. And F is a fiber. And yeah, these fibers, I will we will see later why it's easier. But yeah, so this is the minimal model program. And yeah, so this was the first part of the talk. So it introduced what the minimal model program is. And now, yeah, let's move to the second part, maybe. So summary so far. So X was our variety, and KX is its canonical line bundle, some line bundle on X, which has so much properties about X. And we define what a birational equivalence class of X. 
and there then we did minimal model program which gives us a method to find a nice or minimal representative in the birational equivalence class of x so so far this is what happened any questions so far okay if there are no questions i'll go ahead so even if you didn't follow so far you can come back now because now is the second section which is like where i'll be talking about classification of fanos and how this comes into picture like yeah so for classification of fanos first i'll define what a fano variety is what is a fano variety so you can think of it as a positively curved manifold as i already told varieties can be thought of as manifolds in nice conditions so you can think of it as like it has some positive curvature uh, it's like it it's not like so bad or anything so these are fano varieties so in algebraic geometry the way we define it is using the canonical bundle which i introduced earlier so this uh, anti canonical bundle so anti canonical bundle is the dual of the canonical bundle so this anti canonical bundle we have this notion of positivity uh we can talk whether we can tell whether a line bundle is positive or not so roughly the idea is it intersects with all curves positively curves and limits of curves and everything but yeah you can just assume that there is some kind of positivity as well like yeah which tells us so that tells so literally here if you notice the anti canonical bundle encodes the curvature ideas of a variety so yeah so it, it encodes some information there so examples of fano varieties as we saw projective n space from the beginning that is a fano variety also you can look at the hypersurface so f equals 0 yeah zero of a polynomial in pn with degree of the polynomial strictly uh, less than or equal to n where n is the dimension of the projective space so if the degree of polynomial is like this then it will be a fano variety if it's equal to n plus 1 it is like another kind of variety and like yeah so these are some very well known like easy to understand examples so yeah so these fano varieties are the basic building blocks of varieties in the sense of the minimal model program since they occur as fibers of mori fiber space so i was explaining this fiber space right in that uh, we were telling that understanding fibers and the base space is good enough so literally these fibers are nothing but fano varieties so that is why it's interesting to study fano varieties because understanding them we'll be able to understand all varieties in some sense if you if you understand them and minimal models we are done right yeah everything can be seen as related to them so yeah so why do we there is some kind of yeah classification of smooth fanos which is already like uh, known in dimension 1 in dimension 1 there is only one smooth fano variety which is precisely what we saw p1 that's it there is nothing else this is all and it's known and similarly in dimension 2 there are 10 smooth fano surfaces and that's it nothing else again and in dimension 3 it's like 105 smooth fano three folds like three dimensional manifolds uh deformation families deformation families meaning it's like it's they're like families uh 105 families but within the family there won't be a lot of difference so it's like very nicely varying things so it is if you notice it's like it it looks finite in some sense like maybe not exactly finite but like at least up to families there are only finitely many families or something so and there is a very well known result which is like there are only finitely many deformation families of smooth fanos in any given dimension 
So once we fix a dimension, there are only finitely many families of smooth fanos in that. The number can be big for dimension four and five, and all. the numbers are big maybe, but it's finite for sure. That is the theorem. So hence, it's a very good can candidate for classification problems, right? When things are finite, it's easier. You can just literally get a list and you don't have to, yeah, like the classification process becomes much easier. So that is why this is a very nice place to start the classification problem because you know it's going to be finite. You won't be stuck in a loop or something trying to figure out. So yeah, so this is why classification of fanos is a interesting thing and a good place to start from. So yeah, here, so my project is also a classification of fano 3 fours, but as I, Told the smooth case is already done. So mine is like with some mild singularities introduced and also with additional conditions, like it should occur as hypersurfaces in rank two toric varieties. So I didn't tell what these maybe, yeah, I haven't told what a toric variety is. I'll tell soon. Why look at just hypersurfaces in rank two toric varieties? It, because it makes life so much easier. We'll see how, because toric varieties have a lot of structure, which helps us. Uh, and also the fact that they occur as hypersurfaces gives us more structure. We'll see. What is a toric variety? It is the generalization of Pn. If you remember, we define Pn as quotient of C star acting on C n plus 1 or something. Here, instead of C star, we are going to take the group as C star to the power R acting on C n. So that's it. So it's a generalization. There is some more technicalities, but I'm going to avoid it. And example, when R is one, we already saw PN is an example. We could also generalize it as the weighted projective space, which is denoted like this. Uh, so if we note, if you remember, like we told uh, projective space was just like uh, lines, like space of all lines. And here it weighted projective space is kind of like space of different degree curves. Like for example, space of parabolas or space of cubic curves and stuff like that. So you can think of it like that as well. So the action here, yeah, the action precisely, like last time it was just uh, is all these A0 AIs were just one. Now I'm just like putting based on whatever is the AIs here. So this in this action, whatever is the quotient is our way to projective space. So why is this useful? Because it gives like the action gives like so much combinatorial flavor to these uh, varieties. Because these are literally with these numbers, we can do a lot of computation and it's mostly combinatorics. Uh, otherwise, uh, things in algebraic geometry get a bit weird to actually compute. So, yeah, for example, it makes the FANO check easier. To check if some hypersurface is FANO, it's much easier in these kind of varieties because, like, yeah, if I take a complete intersection, for example, complete intersection meaning the zeros of all these, and also we make sure they intersect transversely and everything. They don't do weird intersections. And... Yeah, this is FANO, if and only if the sum of the degrees is strictly less than the sum of the weights here. So, so literally, to check if something is FANO was like we had to find the canonical bundle. We have to first compute that. And then to check if it is positive, we have to intersect with all curves and everything. It's a very tough process. But it reduces to a very simple like uh, check of numbers. like. Just add, and if it's less, then it's done. So this kind of a combinatorial flavor comes because of the toric variety pipe. So that's why we care more of, care about fanos inside them because it definitely makes our life much easier. And it also helps in like even the types of singularities. So not every time. So now I'm not working with smooth things, right? So there could be some problematic points and everything. So it helps us in computing the type of them also, like how bad they are, how good they are and everything. So 
computations become easier inside them. That is why. So yeah, so some the known result is like in the weighted projective spaces case, we know that there are like, I think it is exactly 130 families, but not sure. 130 families of Fano threefold hypersurfaces with some particular kind of singularities called terminal singularities. So this is a known result. So my project is to work with R equal to two case. So find all families of Fano threefolds with most probably the same kind of singularity or terminal singularity in R equals to two case is my project. And the idea here is like to use the minimal model program. So as if you notice, like uh, I'll reduce the problem to first R equals to one case using the minimal model program and then use the classification in the R equals one case. So in the R equals one case, it's already done. So I'll just use this and obtain a result in the R equals to two case. So how, how do we do this? Because in the minimal model program, we saw the Mori fiber space thing, right? Like the fiber space. And there I will just use the R equals one thing are our fibers. And like now for R equals two, I can just uh, use the R equals one thing and understand the R equal to two case better. So that is how I use the minimal model program in my classification. So this is still an ongoing project and yeah, I'm still working on it. Yeah, so this is my project and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.